Dave Gardner has been hosting or co-hosting the Overpopulation podcast since its inception in 2015. Who is this guy? Why has he been working seven days a week for years to alert people about population overshoot and to save the planet? We'll find out next on the Overpopulation podcast. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast, the podcast that dares to stand up for the right of future generations to live in a world worth inheriting. I'm Nandita Bajaj. My co-host, Dave Gardner, is stepping out of his role as Executive Director of World Population Balance. Fortunately, he plans to continue co-hosting this podcast with me. Just how fortunate that is may be a matter of opinion. Hi, Nandita. It's good to be with you. Hi, Dave. This is going to be an exciting one. Yeah, it could be. Or it could be a snoozer. We'll see. Quick mention that uh, worldpopulationbalance.org is the place to go to learn more about human overpopulation, its compassionate solution, and the nonprofit that works tirelessly to alert, educate, and inspire people to end the overpopulation crisis. In this episode... I thought we should celebrate Dave and his work leading world population balance over the past six years. But before we jump into that, do you have anything to share from the inbox, Dave? I do, I do. But first I want to mention, we're publishing this episode on Earth Day of 2021. So, happy Earth Day, Nandita. How fitting. Happy Earth Day, Dave. Now for the inbox. 51 days ago from the publication of this episode, I got this email from earthday.org. I'm going to read it to you. We're marking 51 days to Earth Day by bringing you 51 actions you can take for the planet. Volunteer for cleanups. Calculate your carbon footprint. Support the Canopy Project. Become inspired by dozens of ideas of how you can work to restore our Earth. Earth Day actions are often the first ways people become involved in environmentalism, and we take our responsibility as the on-ramp to activism seriously. Our role goes beyond one day. We work year-round spreading awareness of climate literacy and regenerative agriculture, building partnerships to support local communities, and organizing cleanups to tackle the trash and plastic problems. For us to make global change, we must have local action. That's where you come in. You can demonstrate your commitment to the environment through individual actions, from composting to contacting your local representatives. Check out our 51 actions in honor of the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Together, we can protect the planet through collective action and unified voices. Now, I'm sharing this with you, Nandita, because I was, I was curious— so I clicked and looked over the list of 51 recommended actions. I, I confess that I was thinking, you know, in a list of 51 things you can do for the planet, there's bound to be room for an item or two about doing something to address overpopulation, right? Always the optimist, Dave. Well, maybe so. Yeah, because sadly, out of those 51 items, there is not a mention of family size, support for family planning, or educating and empowering women and girls. Meanwhile, there's three items about picking up trash. It's a good thing, but it's really pretty lightweight on the list of things to really uh, steer the ship in the direction of sustainability. So it wasn't a matter of not being able to fit all of the important items into a list of 51. They had plenty of room for the, some of the lightweight stuff. So I found that disappointing, and I thought maybe we should just have a brief chat about why you think that might be happening. I agree. That is disappointing. And it may be that it wasn't a calculated decision. But as we continue to see in a lot of sustainability and environmental movements, there is an avoidance, you know, or ignoring or forgetting about overpopulation. And it may just be a hard habit to break. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, and it could be that the list was put together by someone who wasn't maybe a you know at the top of the food chain a really great thought leader and maybe the thought leaders are on to this they're out of the population taboo and they're finished avoiding the subject but because it's been avoided and run from for so long that the communication staff the volunteers a lot of people they're not in the habit of thinking about it or talking about it because it has been avoided you're right when you call it a habit and in this case I'm thinking, well, maybe it wasn't calculated because 
the EarthDay.org organization is doing one really good thing. They are having a population panel on Earth Day with Terry Sparr, the producer of the film Eight Billion Angels, which is all about the overpopulation crisis. Yeah, I agree. It is applause worthy that they are doing that. And maybe it's worth giving them the benefit of the doubt. Yep. So we'll do it. But, you know, got to have just a little bit of wall of shame here for 51 items, really, and not even support family planning on the list. That's an oversight at best. I agree. On that note, check out earthday.org today, April 22nd, to see the 8 Billion Angels panel. We'll put a link in the show notes, too. We do like to hear from our listeners, so if you have any feedback or if there's a topic you'd like us to explore, email us at podcast at worldpopulationbalance.org. All right, Dave, I'm really excited to have this conversation, so let's do it. All right, hit me with your best shot. So it's going to be challenging to encapsulate all six years of your amazing work at World Population Balance in one podcast, but let's do our best. How does it feel to be on the other side of the table? Uh, You know what it is? um, It feels empowering. You know, I've been, there's so many things to say about this. First of all, let me say that even though I am stepping out of my role as executive director, my plan is not to stop co-hosting this podcast with you, although I could get fired by the new executive director at any time, and that would be okay. Let's hope that doesn't happen. I'm happy to keep contributing there, and I'm not leaving the the cause and the activist community. But, you know, and I've been doing the executive director role for six years, and I'm kind of worn out, but it's not from six years of of leading world population balance. It's really from 20 years of working in this field, uh, really starting with local activism in my community and then raising the money and producing the Growth Busters documentary and then the Growth Busters podcast, the Conversation Earth radio series, and then stepping into this role at world population balance. I've got this almost 20-year history and habit of working seven days a week, getting up at 4.30 or 5.30 in the morning, voluntarily, no alarm, just because I got a planet to save. And it is pretty exhausting. So I'm feeling good about being able to relax a little bit, to be able to take time to read a 30-page report or start working my way through the 10-foot tall stack of books on my nightstand. So I'm kind of excited about that. It's such a nice way to pull away from this kind of work. And like you say, you're not really pulling away from your activism work. You're just stepping away from this role so you can have more time to focus on the different ways in which you love advocating for the planet. Yeah. You know, it felt like uh, finishing constructing an airplane while it's in flight. You know? Right. There was never enough time to sit back and pause and reflect. It was like a nonstop stream of uh, fire drills and emergencies. So it feels a little less like a fire drill already. And that's wonderful. And I've got lots of nice questions lined up to find out what Dave's going to be doing post-world population balance. But before I get there, I wanted to first find out, you know, how did this journey into overpopulation advocacy begin? I know you said you were working on the Growth Busters documentary and leading the Conversation Earth radio series and launching the podcast when you took on the leadership role here. But who got you interested in these issues? I'll try not to go on too long about this, but I really started kind of observing and caring about the population issue about 20 years ago. I was living in Dallas, was it 20 years ago? No, even longer than that, really, really more like 30 years ago. Uh, I was living in Dallas, Texas, which was one of my most foolish decisions ever, way too far away from the mountains. But that city was growing like crazy, and the quality of life was going down fast. It was just becoming a miserable place to live, gunfire at night and people really rude to each other on the freeways. And, uh, you know, you could just see the anonymity and the pressure of having so many people packed in there. It wasn't bringing out the best in people. And I, uh, my family made a quality of life decision, moved back to my hometown of Colorado Springs, Colorado, much smaller. And yet 
that city was bound and determined to be as big as Denver as soon as it could. Its metric for success was population growth. Right. And that made me pay attention to it and become concerned about it. And I actually became kind of a local activist about all of the pursuit of growth and the growth subsidies in uh, city and county government here. And it seemed particularly foolish here in the American West we were at the beginning of a drought. Some people are speculating may be a mega drought that is continuing to this day. So it's a foolish place to think that you should keep adding more people. And it's really a ill-advised metric to think that the success of your city, your state, your province, your territory, your country is uh, reflected by how fast your population is growing. On an overpopulated planet, that's just an insane metric and a, and a lousy goal. So I was paying attention to all those things and uh, finally just decided, uh, you know what, somebody needs to do a film about this because this is just a global problem. Yeah. And uh, that kind of launched me down the path of doing the Growth Busters documentary. And I've never been able to go back to doing what I used to do, which was creating propaganda films for Fortune 500 companies and helping the capitalists grow. Right, right. And then you had a change of heart. Yeah, big time, just a, a complete reversal. I'm kind of ashamed of the fact that I spent, you know, 20 or 30 years just cashing those checks and doing that work, telling the stories that weren't really good for the human race. But finally, I decided it was time to tell the right stories. And in a way, it was kind of circling back because when I was in high school, I read Desert Solitaire mm -hmm. by Edward Abbey. And I had some really good experiences that really gave me a good foundation of a, a good conservation ethic. Yeah. But I did what I think what happened to a lot of those young people who, you know, on the first Earth Day, what, 51 years ago, you know, there were a lot of young people who were really concerned about the environment. They were concerned about population growth even and uh, a lot of activism, but that didn't last. A lot of that died down. And I think part of that was, well, you know, you graduate from college, maybe you get married, you know, you plug in yeah. to the system that we have. Yeah. And that's what I did. I got married. I wanted to be a good provider. I was all focused on just building my business and making sure that I was uh, not only being a good provider, but also I was focused on how much money I was making because I was comparing my financial success to my peers. Yeah. And uh, so I got on that treadmill and uh, Fortunately, I had two kids. Why? Well, because that was what you do. Right, yeah. And a uh, little pressure from the wife. But I thought after number two, I got a vasectomy because I had read The Overpopulation Bomb, which Paul and Ann Ehrlich had written back in the late 60s. Uh, so I was aware of the issue. But, you know, I jumped on the treadmill along with everybody else after I got out of college. And it just took me a long time to wake up and figure out where True North really was. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, Dave, your story describes the story of a lot of advocates and in a ton of social justice movements. I think we all kind of follow the script that's written out for us about what success means and what these measures of success are. And I think whether it's in our 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, or later, some of us start recognizing that those aren't the things that bring us true joy or happiness as they're meant to. <laughs> so in some ways, your example is a good one because it mimics the lives of so many of us who've had an awakening later in our lives from somebody else's example. And it also, I think, makes you and other advocates on the field more relatable because you've been on the other side and you show inspiration to those of us who are trying to get on the other side. Well, thanks for saying that. You know, I think that is changing, though, a little bit. I think there are more young people turning on to this. I think probably just because we've damaged the planet to such an extent now that it's pretty hard to miss. Yeah. So I don't think we have to wait for as many people to age to the point where they've seen it and they their kids are out of the house and the pressure's off for them to stay on the treadmill. You know, that was what we kind of had to wait for before. But now I see younger people getting involved like you. You know, you're not even 40 years old and uh, you are committed and passionate about this. And so that's that's the good news I'm thrilled about. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think um, in terms of, you know, the urgency for trying to reverse the trends, it's much more prevalent and and in our face. Unfortunately, yeah. You know, a lot of the younger people are growing up with that knowledge. Yep. So, yeah, no, it's great to hear that story and, and what got you thinking about these things. When you decided to take on the leadership at World Population Balance, you were already involved in quite a few things. What brought you on? What made you decide? You know, in a way, it was a really pretty easy decision because I had uh, I was familiar with World Population Balance. I had met the visionary founder and uh, leader of that organization, Dave Paxson, who founded it back in 1992 and uh, included him in my Growthbusters documentary because he really spoke very articulately about the subject. And then the message was right, which was that we know what the solution is. It's just choosing smaller families. Mm. We don't need to dictate it or legislate it. We just need to make sure everyone is aware that we are already overpopulated. So let's use the word overpopulation. Let's not run away from it. Uh, that was a part of the messaging of world population balance, and that impressed me. So when he decided it was time for him to ease out a little bit, he and I talked, and, I, and we knew we needed someone very committed and very passionate and ideally very knowledgeable on the subject. And we looked around and, wow, I was the leading candidate, maybe the only candidate. So it was an easy yes, but I, was, uh, I wasn't I was willing to give up the Growth Busters right. work that I was doing. So I said, I can only do this part-time. I'll, I'll just uh, be an hourly person so that, uh, you know, on weeks or months where I can hardly show up, uh, you know, I'm not drawing a salary for doing nothing. But the job grew and uh, over the six years, almost six years that I've held the position, it's been sneaking up to more and more of a full-time job. And it really should have been full-time right. all along because it's such an important issue. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, whether you were the only candidate or not, uh, you were the right candidate. It's nice of you to say. I've been uh, you know, so touched by the work that you've done for World Population Balance. My only introduction to the organization was through you, you know, in the last three or four years. And I've been listening to your podcasts religiously, and I love them. And I feel that's something that was very unique that you hit upon in bringing to World Population Balance. Can you speak a bit more about your initiative and decision to start the Overpopulation Podcast? Sure. You know, one of the uh, frustrations that I've long had, continues to this day, is that the issue doesn't get uh, proper treatment in the media. There are not enough news stories about it. And most of the time when journalists write or report on the issue, they're really sadly misinformed. So they perpetuate some of the myths the general public is not getting the information and the perspective that they really need to get and they deserve to get. So, you know, I continue to bang my head against the wall and try to find ways to bring journalists around. But at the same time, look at podcasts. Podcasts is a way that we get the power in our own hands. Yeah. So why not become the media? Uh, instead of just complaining about what the media is doing, I decided let's become the media. So we launched that podcast and I've never for a minute regretted it. It's one of the, my proudest accomplishments. I really do feel like the Overpopulation podcast is uh, really good, rock solid information and perspective to either turn people on to the subject or to help people kind of improve their literacy about the subject and and find good ways to alert other people and educate them and inspire informed and fully considered family-sized decisions. Yeah, yeah, no, and you really should be proud of this accomplishment. You know, number one, podcasting is such an accessible and engaging way for people to consume information, especially the kind that's relevant to them. A lot of organizations do social media, webinars, campaigns, etc. You know, and all of them are excellent means of information sharing, but there's something so unique and personal about podcasting. You, you feel like you're eavesdropping on a great conversation and it's something you can do pretty much anytime, anywhere. You know, you're walking, you're doing dishes, etc. And, you know, the one thing is you have to have the right skills to be able to pull it off. And luckily, you do. A big mouth, I suppose. <laughs> but, 
you know, there's a couple of things you hit on there. One is that uh, you can do it while you're doing other things. So it's one of the last places where people will dig deep. If you were trying to do videos on YouTube, you know, if the video is longer than two or three minutes, good luck keeping an audience. Yeah. Uh, people, if they're going to watch a video, they pretty well have to stop everything else they're doing. But you can garden, you can exercise, you can commute and listen to these podcasts. Plus, we thought about, well, who is the most important audience for this message, for trying to alert and educate and inspire action? Uh, certainly, there are a lot of audiences. You know, we, we need journalists to understand this subject. We need policymakers to recognize the crisis. And there's something for everybody. There's a role for everyone in resolving the crisis. But, of course, the most critical final action that we're after is for young people to make informed family size decisions. And hopefully over the long haul, the average family size needs to be continuing to shrink and it needs to be shrinking faster. So if we're trying to reach a young audience, you know, you don't want to do uh, a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where are the young people? You don't want to even be on the radio. You want to be doing a podcast. That's where the young adults are. Uh, that's where they are. So that turned out to be pretty smart, too. Yeah, and what a great way of just keeping on normalizing the conversation. You know, it really allows people to listen in wherever they are on their journey and get something out of it. So, and I have to say, I'm so thrilled that you are going to continue doing this because I think without you, the podcast will probably die. Well, I have to disagree with you about that. But anyway, I'm not through uh, with my rants and pontifications, so I'll keep doing it as long as I'm, I'm welcome to do that. But you know what? Sometimes I wonder if we wouldn't be, gosh, if just Joe Rogan would spend five or ten minutes on every episode talking about this issue, we might uh. make greater strides in normalizing the, the small family meme or whatever you want to call it. Well, Dave, when you retire, you're going to have a little bit of extra time on your hands, and I hope you can start lobbying Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot, perhaps. Put it on my list. So you started in 2015 with World Population Balance. What was the state of the population issue then when you took it over? And how does it compare to where things are at now? That's a great question. The uh, You know, it's only six years ago, so you can't say that there's been a whole lot of change. But there has been some change. I think back then the population taboo was more firmly entrenched than it is today. I think the word overpopulation was rarely mentioned. Uh, if it was mentioned, it was just in relation to the population of deer or feral cats or something like that. It wasn't really related to human population much at all. I think the activist community was smaller and they hadn't found each other. It was a lot more often that someone would say, wow, I didn't know anyone else cared about this when they found World Population Balance or the podcast. So over the past six years, and I'm going to sound like I'm tuning my own horn, but I really genuinely believe this. And I've seen evidence that I think backs it up that the work of world population balance has had a significant impact on the changes. The fact that the population taboo is dissolving. It's not completely gone, but it's mm -hmm. going away. And that the discussion is happening more and more. Several more films have been made about the subject over the last 10 years and yeah. uh, certainly the last six. And uh, the activist community is a little more cohesive in finding each other. World population balance has played a huge role in that. But there's still a lot of denial, avoidance, lack of awareness, myths and misassumptions out there. There's still plenty of work for world population balance to do, but we have uh, become a more of a global voice. It was a little bit provincial. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave Paxson was kind of an old-fashioned kind of a guy, and he was a great public speaker, so he would talk to classes uh, high school, college, uh, service clubs, churches, but that really kind of limited his uh, influence to, uh, you know, within 100 miles of Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he founded the organization. And I just thought, wow, this issue is so important and the message that world population balance has, it's global. It's so important that it needs to go global. So, uh, I think the organization definitely became a lot more virtual and more international. And uh, and I think it's on uh, – the glide path it's on now is is up. It's growing, uh, it's growing stronger, and I'm really excited about its future under newer, younger leadership. 
Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I hadn't thought about that, but I think the fact that it became global is probably the reason that I became aware of it. I hadn't known about the organization for the longest time until I started, you know, hearing podcasts ah. and I am here in Canada and I couldn't agree more with you that this message choosing smaller families and helping to normalize the different types of families is so important and especially for those of us who have the privilege of choice in industrialized countries having the reach in a global way has a much larger impact. I have said even in this episode that there's a role for everyone in solving the crisis. So it's important to educate everybody and alert everyone. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't just kind of run down a checklist of what world population balance is is doing, which is really pretty impressive considering the somewhat uh, modest budget and very modest staff. You know, we've got two podcasts, the Overpopulation Podcast, and You Had Me at Child Free. We've got three websites, a, a very robust online activist community, monthly virtual meetups, overpopulation update emails twice a month, the ending overshoot publication on Medium, occasional webinars, and uh, plans for some other new things, billboard campaign uh, in the past and uh, in the future as well. Uh, it's it's amazing that the organization is doing that with a handful of part-time employees. It is. It's very impressive. And, you know, in large part, congratulations to you for being able to pull that off. Yeah, I take full credit. That's all, all me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not. <laughs> and in fact, that really sparks an idea that is important to get across. And that is, wow, you know, I inherited you know, a couple of part-time staff members who are still there. It didn't take me long to discover that Alan Ware and Carolyn Vandendolder were uh, were gems. They were just, uh, they just have phenomenal knowledge of and passion about the subject and, and uh, give Dave Paxson full credit for educating them on the subject. And they're just uh, a dream team. So they deserve a lot of the credit for what we've done over the last six years. I've really enjoyed meeting them, and I love working with them on these, you know, roundtable conversations that we have. Yeah. Boy, I've had to really twist their arms to get them behind the microphone, but they are great. I don't think they realize uh, how valuable their perspective is when we get them around the table. I agree. And so, uh, Dave, in terms of forward thinking, I know you're leaving, but do you have any hopes for the organization? What do you hope the organization will look like in five years? I do. But I also want to say, I hate to call it I'm leaving because my hope is to stick around and butt in frequently and make the life of the new executive director pretty miserable, really, <laughs> as the former guy. No, I'm determined to be available as a help and an advisor uh, as invited. And if it's important for me to disappear, then I will. But otherwise, I want to do more writing and continue to help with the Ending Overshoot publication and the podcast. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go away. Uh, maybe I'll go away softly and, and, and slowly. I'm looking forward to finding out what new, younger leadership has in store for us. Because if I knew what we needed to be doing, then it would probably make sense for me to keep leading the organization. But, you know, let's face it, I'm an old white guy, and we, we have valuable knowledge and perspective. Our thoughts shouldn't be dismissed just because we're old white guys. But I can yeah. understand why some people might be a little bit suspicious and cautious about our perspective. And so if there are younger, more diverse people out there, and especially women's voices, you know, I expect we'll hear more from younger, more diverse people as world population balance continues. I think uh, my hope is that the organization will become an even stronger voice for change around the world, you know, in five years, that it will be an organization that most journalists say, oh, we're doing a story about overpopulation we must get in touch with world population balance and see what their leadership has to say about this. I think it would be great if in five years there are a few more uh, full-time professionals on staff. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that could help with that. So beyond that, 
I don't know. I can't wait to find out. Well, we'll see. And a little plug in for the old white guys, because I owe a lot of my knowledge and inspiration to some amazing old white men and women and among, you know, many other people. But like you just said, I think everyone has a role to play in the movement. And I'm not a big fan of dismissing voices just because some people say they're not relevant. Well, thanks for that. That is one of the things that I think made you such a good choice as a co-host for this podcast. Thank you. So Dave, on to some fun questions. What action in your advocacy took the most courage? You know, I think that's a tough one. And there might be two, uh, may, maybe there's two answers. And one is just to become an advocate. Right. That took courage just because, you know, you do have to be a little bit bulletproof. You are setting yourself up. You're really, you know, I've kind of joked about it a little bit that trying to get the world unhooked from its growth addiction is harder work than if you were to set out to convince the world that the Pope was the Antichrist. It would be easier to do that than it is to dethrone this worship of growth everlasting. So that was one thing is just having the courage to stand up and say, you know, I don't care that I'm going to be looked at like a crazy person by all the people who are addicted to growth and don't recognize what we're doing to the planet. But then secondarily, probably just last year when the billboard campaign went big in Canada, in the country where you live, yeah. there was a, a pretty concerted effort by some to give that campaign a bad name and, you know, really cancel it. Mm -hmm. You know, the campaign was a mischaracterized and, and accused of being what it wasn't. And, uh, you know, once somebody starts that on Twitter, man, that can really take off. And so it took some courage to go ahead and accept invitations to do news interviews, even though I knew that the news out there, in many cases, was mischaracterizing the campaign. Right. Yeah. And I also love your answer that just standing up to become an advocate is a very courageous thing to do. And you're not just advocating for environmentalism, for animal rights, for human rights, for, you know, other social justice issues. You've grabbed on to the most inconvenient, unpopular advocacy work, which is overpopulation. And so that in itself is a very courageous thing to do. Yeah, I guess you're right about that. <laughs> The only person with more courage <laughs> is the person who married the crazy guy who is doing that. You know, I to, <laughs> sometimes I wonder how Ruth puts up with that because I really do, you know, in, in so many ways, doing this work is putting a target on your back. Right. Uh, but we know we're, gosh, we are, you know, what we're doing is we're, it's the most loving work. We are really doing the most compassionate work for the beautiful future that the children alive today and the children who may, if we're lucky, be alive in future generations, they deserve to have a beautiful future. And without our work, they're, they're not going to get that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Dave. In fact, I mean, my own reason for getting involved in overpopulation work is because this is the one advocacy area that includes all other social justice issues you know, for the most part, in terms of human rights, in terms of animal protection, in terms of environmental preservation, you know, overpopulation makes all of those things much more difficult to address. Yeah. And really, in a way, not just more difficult, but pretty much impossible. Yeah. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to circle back to uh, Ruth and your family. Do they think you're crazy? I think they do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Most of the people close to me in my life think I'm right. And in fact, my kids, I'm pretty confident, really respect and support what I'm doing. So I think I've become a really good role model, and I'm proud of that. But uh, I imagine that my mother and my wife would probably just celebrate, pop the champagne if I told them, yeah, not going to do that anymore. <laughs> Which is not going to happen. Yeah. You know, I guess there's, I was always the class clown. I'm a little bit of a ham. So clearly I want attention for some reason. So I think I'm kind of enjoying the fact that I'm a little bit notorious here in my own community. I'm a little less notorious worldwide. I'm not that well known. You know what? A young lady was over at the house considering putting in a rain barrel to harvest rainwater to do a little bit of, you know, put that water to better use than just having it run down into the sewer system. And uh, the, the young lady said, oh, yeah, I know of you. I've heard about you. <laughs> I've heard your podcast. And that felt pretty good. 
That's incredible. Yeah. Normally, you would hear someone from across the country say that to you, but in your own neighborhood, that's very cool. Yeah. So I have to confess that I think there's a little bit of me that the class clown just says, that's great. I have an audience. But really, more important to me is just, you know, I want the attention because I want to save the planet. I want people to know what we're doing to the planet and how we can fix that. Yeah. No, it's it's great to channel that kind of energy and motivation into doing good. Might as well. In fact, I'm thinking about with a little bit more time on my hands, I might try to learn how to be a stand-up comic and do a stand-up routine about these subjects. Oh, wow. Well, you've, you've received lots of compliments on your sense of humor. So that seems like a nice route for you to follow. We'll see. We'll see. Be careful what you wish for. Well, don't make world population balance notorious with any kind of inappropriate jokes or we'll have to cut ties with you totally. (laughs) (laughs) I've been warned. (laughs) And so, Dave, in terms of all of the different people you've met along the way, um, in terms of interviews you've had and heroes you've, you know, had along the the six years at World Population Balance and then countless more years that you've been doing advocacy work. Is there a person or an interview or a book that really changed your mind about, you know, something that you believe in? That's a great question. Thanks for that. There's not a yes answer to anybody who really caused me to, you know, slam on the brakes and take a right turn or a left turn, except Brian Check, who founded and is the executive director of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, he wrote a great book that I cannot recommend too highly called Shoveling Fuel for a Runaway Train. And that really woke me up when I was doing research about overpopulation. It woke me up to the fact that, well, our numbers are half of the problem. The other half of the problem is our obsession with uh, economic growth and our right. pursuit of economic growth. That really woke me up to that. So I got to give Brian Check and shoveling fuel for a runaway train credit for that. Um, you know, certainly I have some heroes. I, I don't think they changed that my mind, but they inspired me. Edward Abbey, Al Bartlett, the now late Al Bartlett, who's really world famous physicist at University of Colorado, famous for his lecture about uh, exponential growth in bacteria. Al was uh, certainly an inspiration. And of course, Paul Ehrlich, uh, he's just a hero to me because he, I know even to this day, he is vilified by growth pushers Mm -hmm. uh, and mischaracterized. But he has, you know, this guy is approaching 90 Mm -hmm. and he is still out there telling the truth. He's not afraid to tell the truth. Uh, He doesn't soft pedal it. uh, And he does it in an interesting and engaging way. So interesting that I think it was what something like 28 appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Right. You know, somebody's got to be interesting enough that they uh, talking about this, that they get those kind of invitations. You know, we need Bill Maher to keep talking about this subject. Fortunately, he does some. We need Stephen Colbert to get religion about this. We need Trevor Noah. We've got some work to do because some of those, uh, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, I don't see Paul Ehrlich uh, as a guest on their show. I haven't seen Dave Gardner as a guest on their show. show. Maybe our goal should be to get the next executive director of World Population Balance to be a regular on some of those uh, late night, you know, you used to call them comedy, talk variety, but there are a lot, a lot of people get their news yeah. from those shows. So it'd be great if we could get on there. And I know I really got off on a tangent there. Apologies. No, that would be a, a very cool goal to have. Is there an interview that you've always wanted to do, but it hasn't come to fruition yet? You know, it's funny. I think the interviews that are still on my, dang, we really got to get that list, are with people who are not out there saying the right things about this subject. They're the people who, in my view, my humble opinion, have got it wrong. I would love to have George Monbiot, the UK Guardian columnist, who continues to rage on in overpopulation denial and and the shaming of sustainable population advocacy. I would love to get uh, Garnett Jenis, the member of the Canadian House of Commons, who, who railed against our uh, billboard campaign and put 
ads on buses uh, promoting large families. Why can't we get him on and, you know, let him tell us what his perspective is about that? The magazine editorial team at Sierra Club, yeah. you know, who have uh, engaged in population denial. I'd love to get them on. I'd love to have some open dialogue. The woman who writes the Ask Umbra column at Grist. These are just some examples of people that we've invited to have on who are, you know, I don't know what the deal is. Yeah, They're afraid we're right. How could they sound intelligent if they yeah. came on? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, those are some excellent suggestions and great answers. But there are some smart people that I have a lot of respect for that I'd love to have on to. Greta Thunberg would be great. Uh, Bindi Irwin uh, in Australia, who has been had the courage to speak up and write about overpopulation. I'd love to give the microphone to some of the young women who are getting it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I wanted to say, you know, if you could actually get George Monbiot on the Overpopulation podcast... And, you know, have a real heart to heart conversation about where some of his, you know, fears of overpopulation are stemming from. It would do the world so much good. Yeah. And, you know, our approach would be respectful. You know, we're not going to invite anybody on just to trash them. If they continue to decline our invitations or ignore us, we might be a little less respectful <laughs> right. uh, behind their back. Uh, you know, I'd much rather have them on. And uh, most people have a good heart. Yeah. And uh, so uh, having more of these conversations can only be good for us all. I agree. I agree. I think there is something to be said about why the denial is there in the first place. And I think the people who truly believe talking about overpopulation advocacy is bad, you know, some of them are coming from a place of fear. And, you know, about things that have happened that weren't good in the past. But I think there is, like you're saying, room to move away from this kind of divisive talk. Yeah, those fears are really founded and stuck in the past. And, yeah. and, if, we, and if you keep brushing the subject under the rug, then that allows the misassumptions and the, and the handful of people with, uh, you know, either ill intent or misguided intentions. It just allows them to kind of continue uh, instead of allowing them to become educated uh, about how the modern sustainable population advocacy and action is none of the things that are feared yes. from the past. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, having the world discover that is being held back a little bit by people like George Monbiot. So Dave, would you consider yourself generally hopeful for the future? Where would you fall on the spectrum of you know, optimism and pessimism? Well, I will say that it's getting harder and harder to be hopeful, but I think I must be, or I'm not sure I would be working so hard at this. You know, there's some dignity in continuing this work, even if you're convinced that the end is near, because it, you know, it's acting with integrity, nevertheless. But I think what gives me hope is that, you know, we could be, you know, there's talk about tipping points with relation to climate change. Uh, but this is a tipping point I want to talk about is just with regard to public attitudes and the public conversation. We might be closer than we think to a, a tipping point where suddenly the world is really ready to acknowledge that there is an overpopulation crisis and to have open conversation about what it takes to address it because we really do need a global campaign to make sure everyone is alerted, to make sure that uh, people are have the power and the information to make really fully informed family-sized decisions and that public policy isn't working against shrinking the global population back to a sustainable size. Uh, you know, kind of like the climate crisis really was not getting very much attention until Al Gore came out with that movie, An, An, An Inconvenient Truth. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, a year later, we still had a lot of problems, but global warming and climate change became household words. And overpopulation isn't there yet, but it might be right around the corner. So that gives me the hope that keeps uh, firing my engines every day is that uh, even though there's so much inaction today, you know, it could change over almost overnight. Yeah, that's awesome. That is great. Wouldn't it be incredible for every single movement to consider overpopulation as one of the, the themes that they're trying to address in addition to the passion that they're advocating for. Yeah. And it's just this irrational fear of, 
historical, ugly, you know, things that are today are misassumptions and mischaracterizations that just don't apply today. So, yeah. that, you know, there's no good reason today uh, for everyone to avoid including this on their list of must take care of. Yeah. This week, we must take care of this crisis today. Yeah. And only good reasons to be talking about this. Yep. And there's not a single downside or drawback. None. I agree. I agree, especially the way in which, you know, we're approaching it with, you know, a humane, compassionate approach that truly liberates people and all living beings. Yep. All right. So I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to try wrapping it up with wanting to know what the next steps look like. So we all know you as the population and growth busters guy. What's Dave's life outside of advocacy work and what does post world population balance life look like for you? You know, that question forces me to admit that this work has really defined me largely. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe that's why I don't think I can just stop. Uh, I really love the outdoors. So I'm really hoping to spend more time hiking and camping and seeing the some of the wonders of nature that we still have out there. And I'm looking forward to being able to spend a little bit more time promoting community in my own community. That's kind of been a little bit of a of a sideline is trying to get the people in, in my hometown here in Colorado Springs uh, better informed, better engaged, and, uh, you know, give the microphone to more people who are doing good things. So I'm looking forward to having a little bit more time to do that. But, uh, but I really think the the movement to solve the overpopulation crisis and the you know the crazy love affair with uh, overconsumption and economic growth i think it you know it might benefit a little bit more from me being able to just kind of sit back and think longer and harder about uh, what the world needs you know more strategically i won't have my hands on the the yoke uh, in the cockpit of the plane i'll be able, i'll be on the ground looking at the radar and the weather forecast and uh Maybe thinking a little bit more strategically, I hope. It's much needed time for you to take that step back and and look at the big picture. And you're the big ideas guy, and it'll be nice to have that time to innovate again with your mind and not have to worry about some of the practicalities of running an organization. So We'll see. Yeah. And the world of stand-up comedy might change. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be there. Rooting for you. Oh, thank you. I will insist that you're in the audience. (laughs) Well, um, I'm ready to end, Dave, if if you are. Was there anything that that I've left off? I think it's been a pretty thorough conversation. I'm really pretty uncomfortable spending an hour talking about me, but it's been nice to have a chance to rant and and rave a little bit about some of my pet peeves. So thanks for that. I just want to say, just in case I get fired from my job of uh, co-host of the Overpopulation podcast, so far, Nandita, it's been such a pleasure to have you uh, almost across the table as a partner in that. I hope that we get to continue doing that. And I also want to say I am so so thrilled and excited about uh, the new executive director who will be stepping in in May to assume the leadership role at World Population Balance. You know, look out, world. You thought it was a wild ride with Dave Gardner at the Yoke. Just wait till you see what our new executive director has in store. And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to name that person because we are trying to sort of do a big announcement uh, closer to the time that the uh, the reins are, are handed over, and we're right around the corner from that. Well, Dave, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today and also just being a partner co-hosting this with you. Thank you for inspiring me to join World Population Balance and to invite me to be your co-host. It's been a thrill ride so far. And uh, I, I do hope that we continue to keep this on. Well, thanks for what you've done so far. Thank you. And I do feel like we've really just scratched the surface of of all your accomplishments and what you've brought to the table and, you know, excited to keep learning more about it. But this sure was fun. Thank you so much for your tireless efforts as the executive director for over the past six years and countless more years working towards a sustainable future for our planet. You are welcome. 
you know, and on the subject of the next executive director, look for an announcement about that in early May. And the next podcast, um, our hope is to be a chance to get to know the new executive director. So the next episode of the Overpopulation podcast will be much more important than this one. It'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay, so we like to uh, close these with uh, with a quote. And uh, the quote I've got for us today is from the young Pakistani activist Malala Yousafzai. And this quote is, My dream is for every girl to choose her own future. And kind of paired with that, I also want to share that Malala also said, You'll never know who stands with you if you don't stand up first. That's such a powerful quote and lines up so well with our mission. Wouldn't it be incredible to have her on the podcast? Yep, put her on the short list, absolutely. Well, so Malala, if you're out there listening, we'd love to have you on. Please reach out to us. Well, that's it for this edition of the Overpopulation Podcast. Thank you, Dave, for your candor on this episode and for everything that you've done so far for world population balance and for the planet. Anytime, anytime. Be sure to visit worldpopulationbalance.org to learn more. And uh, at the website, you can sign the Sustainable Population Pledge, listen to all of our podcasts, all 60 of them now. Uh, You can get on our email list. And really important, you can make a donation to support the vital work of World Population Balance going forward. And it's really good stuff that are in the plans. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Please write to us. We love hearing from you, and we often share your thoughts on the podcast. You can write to us at podcast at worldpopulationbalance.org. Be sure to recommend this episode to friends, family, colleagues, journalists, and elected representatives. And click subscribe or follow in your podcast app so you don't miss an episode. Until next time, we know how to end overpopulation. Stand up for every girl to choose her own beautiful future.